Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to the course Introduction to the Psychology of Bilingualism and Multilingualism. I am Dr. Ark Verma from the Department of Cognitive Sciences, IIT Kanpur. We are in the third week of the course and from today onwards, I am going to talk to you uh, about speech production in bilinguals and multilinguals. What is speech? You know, speech is in, in some sense, it's one of the most fundamental skills that we, uh, you know, take for granted. But basically, that is the language that we sort of, you know, that is how we understand our language or communication abilities. Uh, writing came much later, reading came much later, but one of the primary uh, 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 manifestations of human communication ability is language, which is expressed through uh, spoken words, spoken sentences, and hence uh, is basically referred to as speech. The question that we are going to talk about in the coming two, three lectures is mainly concentrated about how is how do bilinguals speak or how do say for example uh, they manage uh, uh, speaking in two languages without an inter uh, without a lot of interference from either one how do they switch across languages how do they code mix a lot of times how do they uh, basically uh, are able to uh, how are they basically able to communicate effectively having known uh, or uh, you know having uh, known two or more than two languages now the thing is, if we need to understand how uh, you know speech production works in bilinguals or multilinguals, it makes sense for us to also uh, you know pay some attention to how is speech production uh, accomplished by monolingual speakers as well, because that would give us a baseline in some sense to understand how would speech production actually uh, take place in case of bi or multilinguals. Okay. So, uh, as I already said, majority of human communication occurs via speech. It includes a range of steps from conceptualizing an idea that a speaker wishes to convey uh, and to basically a set of behaviors that would change the physical environment. Say, for example, uh, if I uh, give you a particular topic to speak or if I intend, uh, you know, stand here and intend to speak about bilingualism, uh, the first part of the process is for me to conceptualize what do I want to talk about. Uh, the second would be formulating how do I want to talk about it and the final would be articulation where I will create, you know, some kind of behavior which is basically moving my vocal apparatus, uh, creating sound that carries meaning which will be understood by my listeners. So, it is this tripartite process of conceptualization, formulation and articulation that basically explains the process of speech production and this would be true for monolinguals as well as bilinguals and multilinguals as well. Let us take an example, you know, for example, a compliment conversation, how does this really start? Say for example, you could, you could, you meet somebody, you like, let us say their shirt and you uh, go on and you tell them, oh, I like your shirt, this is a very good color and the person would listen it and would react appropriately saying, oh, thanks uh, and then you can, uh, you know, uh, uh, take the conversation forward by saying, oh, where did you get it? Oh, I got it from uh, this particular market in this city and so on and so forth. So, this is just an example of a typical conversation. We have all kinds of conversations. Say for example, uh, a lot of times you will see that conversations typically revolve around generic formulas. For example, if you wa want to have a weather conversation, it's typically uh, you know a decent conversation starter uh, when you're meeting somebody for the first time. So you know typically people would be like, "Oh, today is really uh, hot or cold or rainy or anything uh, outside," and the person would say, "Yes, yes, I am also feeling cold or I am also feeling uh, rather warm." And then you could sort of say, okay, okay uh, I hope the weather becomes warmer or colder uh, as it goes ahead and so on and so forth. So, typically if you see this process of having a conversation basically has these multiple steps where you are talking about a particular topic, you are uh, conceptualizing how you will put yourself across and then you formulate the right words, the right sentences, the right form of how you want to convey the message and going forward you can basically, uh, you know, uh, take the message forward to other topics and so on and so forth. So, there are you know, they, it could be a, a lunchtime conversation uh, as well. There could be any number of conversations that we have in the same sense. Uh, 
But if you look at these conversations uh, closely, you could ask yourself certain questions. For example, how do we retrieve these linguistic representations, say for example, when we want to talk about, let's say somebody's shirt. So, I know what a shirt is, I have the conceptual representation of a shirt or let us say if I am going to talk about weather, I know what weather is, what I am talking about, I am talking about the general climatic condition of that place in that moment. So, how do we sort of from these thoughts, how do I pick up linguistic representations uh, that uh, you know uh, which are best suited to convey this idea. And then how do we organize these representations? We don't speak, uh, you know, randomly. We don't speak just a constellation of words which are not organized. We typically speak in a particular order. We typically speak, when we speak, our words are grammatically correct. Say, for example, I will not say, oh, the weather, how it is. Oh, the weather, how is it? We will basically, oh, oh how the weather is uh, today, something like that. So, we also organize these representations in a particular order in sense of grammar as well as semantics. For example, uh, if you want to talk about a particular idea, you will basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, organize your, uh, you know, ideas in a particular sense that it seems coherent and it seems uh, like a logical flow of, uh, uh, you know, conversation. So, uh, finally, the question that one can ask is that how are these representations, once you have organized them, retrieved them, how are they translated into a form that the motor system can use to generate the physical actual gestures which are utilized to uh, articulate them. See, uh, the first two parts, conceptualization and formulation are still abstractions of the process of speaking. But the final part which is articulation is actually a physical activity because you need to move your tongue, you need to move your mouth, you need to uh, stop the flow of air in your vocal apparatus in order to speak, in order to create uh, speech. So, these are the three very important questions that we can ponder about speech production. Uh, in this lecture, I am going to talk mainly about monolingual speech production, but I would encourage you to, you know, take a pause at every moment and say, oh, how would this happen when a person has two languages? And we will basically see how we sort of go ahead with this. So, as I said, uh, the three, the tripartite process of speech production has three parts, conceptualization, formulation and articulation. Very basically, conceptualization means thinking of something to say, what do I want to talk about? Formulation, how do I figure, how do I, you know, uh, express this idea in the best possible way and articulation is the final part of moving the muscles to produce the sounds that can be perceived by the listener. A very interesting model, a very interesting theory on this account was presented by uh, William Levelt uh, in a model which he named as the Weaver++ plus plus model and we are going to sort of go through uh, very briefly with some of the stages of this model. You can see that at the top here is the conceptual preparation in terms of lexical concepts. What is a lexical concept? A lexical concept is basically concept which can be expressed in the words of our language. In case of bilinguals, it could be, uh, you know, uh, it could be a concept that could be expressed in two languages or three languages, uh, you know, the whatever the num number of languages we know. Uh, typically, you will come across more than one lexical concept at any point in time. So, you need to do lexical selection. You will need, uh, you will reach a level after that which is called the lemma level which has both semantics and syntax information. Uh, you go to morphological encoding. Where you are basically wondering about the type of word that is going to be used. You create a morpheme, then you go to the phonological encoding part where you are sort of, uh, you finalize the morpheme that you have to uh, communicate, but you have to uh, assemble sounds for it create the phonological word, go to uh, how the word has to be, uh, you know, actually produced in phonetic encoding and then is the gestural score which leads us to sort of, uh, you know, produce speech. Let us go in a little bit of detail of these models because at this point in the slide I have just sort of given you an overview, but we can obviously visit it in a bit more detail and try and appreciate how this would change or what will be the special uh, uh, tweaks in this model that we will need to do if we want to explain bilingual or multilingual word uh, production in this. So, uh, as we have seen, speech production can be viewed as a process involving a sequence of mental uh, uh, steps. Uh, each mental process accomplishes a smaller goal, a sub goal and the output of one mental process works as the input of the next one. Now, this is something which is peculiar to this model. It basically for, uh, follows what is called a feed forward kind of a process. So, uh, let us say we start with something like, okay, uh, 
uh, you know conceptual preparation which is at the top here and con during conceptual preparation we are choosing about the ideas that we want to speak about we are choosing the idea that we wanting to speak about oh do i want to have a lunch time conversation do i want to talk about weather do i want to talk about the nice dress that a person is wearing what is it that i want to really talk about the output of this process once you have a sense of what you really want to talk about is a lexical concept and a lexical concept is an basically an idea for which your language has a label so the idea is say for example if you want to talk about uh, uh, you know uh, let us say uh, beauty or you want to talk about a particular person's shirt or whether uh, your language should have words to be able to express that idea to take a more concrete example uh, for uh, if you want to talk about a female horse there is a word in a, in english language called mare and you can if you talk if you're seeing and talking about a female horse you can use the word mare and it basically encompasses all the meaning that you want to convey in the word mare however if one were to talk about a female elephant there is not a single word that uh, is convert is uh, you know in, that encapsulates that idea so you'll be forced to use both the words female and elephant and that will be your lexical concept so this is basically how what we are doing is we are converting a pre verbal uh, uh, message into a uh, actual verbal uh, thing by mapping the thoughts onto these words which are these lexical concepts now one could ask that can all ideas be very neatly expressed with individual words probably not because a lot of times you will see people telling you that oh i am so happy that i cannot express in words or i cannot describe in words what i am feeling at this point in time so basically what is happening is this process of mapping the uh, thoughts to these lexical concepts is referred to as the process called lexicalization and lexicalization basically serves as an intermediary between non linguistic thought processes and the linguistic uh, items or lexical uh, items that can produce verbal expressions to convey these thoughts so this is precisely what we are trying to do now a uh, lot of times it would happen that the number of lexical concepts that you have for a given idea may be more than one so for example if you want to talk about let us say a particular emotion let's say you want to talk about being happy so you can be talk you can talk about oh i am very happy i am very elated i am overjoyed uh, i am uh, uh, you know in a blissful state you can basically come up with any number of words uh, or, or a large number of words to sometimes express a single idea now what would happen in that kind of a scenario in that kind of a scenario what would happen is that you will need to select you will need to perform lexical selection you will need to select the appropriate word for that point in time so do you do you think that overjoyed is the best expression to convey what you are feeling at the moment or just happy is the best one or elated is one so you select from any number of words that you uh, uh, you are made available with you can basically say okay this is the word that i want to go with and this at this process the output that comes out is called the lemma now a lemma is an abstract mental representation which reflects a slightly intermediate stage between activating an idea and activating the exact speech sound so it is something which is very similar to a word but it is an abstraction it is not an exact word itself it is an abstraction of that word you can say it's a root idea for a given word which carries with itself both semantic information what is it that i want to convey within the word that i am choosing as well as syntactic information how do i want that thing to uh, you know play out say for example if i am talking about uh, let's say a, a particular activity uh, let's say play uh, am i talking about play am i talking about playfulness am i talking about playing what is it that i am talking about if i am talking about eat uh, am am i talking about he ate a sandwich a day ago uh, he is going to eat the sandwich now he is eating the sandwich now so you can see the root form of this word is the word ate which is the lemma but it can carry information both about the meaning that oh i want to convey something about the act of eating but is also carrying the information about the syntax that is what is the situation about eating that i want to convey so this is what a lemma is so therefore we have said that lemma incorporates information both about the uh, meaning and the syntax of a given idea now once you have an activated set of lemmas uh, then you move slightly further you activate the process or you uh, initiate the process of activating the sound codes uh, that we sort of need 
for speech to begin. So, then what we are doing is, then we are sort of uh, finalizing upon that exact type or that exact variation of a given word that we want to go ahead with and we move to what is called morphological encoding. Now, before I talk to you about morphological encoding, I am sure you would know that morphological morphemes are, uh, you know, the basic units of language representation. Basically, in any language, uh, they are the basic units in which, uh, you know, the language can be uh, uh, cut down into or reduced to and morphological uh, and morphemes in, in that sense are basically two kinds of unit which carry meaning. First is lexical morphemes which can stand alone say for example uh, any number of words you can say play, eat, sleep, uh, uh, you know run, cry etc etc these are all free morphemes because they can stand alone on themselves. But if I change them say for example if I do uh, a playing then the ing part is called a grammatical morpheme because per se by itself it does not have a meaning but once it is attached to the morpheme play it modifies the word play's meaning. So, it this one ing, er, ess etc are basically called grammatical morphemes. Now, in morphological encoding basically what one needs to do is one needs to uh, sort of finalize that okay, this is the word that I am going to go with, this is that specific form of the word. So, am I going with eat or am I going with eating or am I going with ate? So, this exact form of word is basically specified at the level of morphological encoding. Now, uh, Levitt basically says that each for each word that we need to speak, we would basically need to specify uh, the morphological form and hence we would go to the step called morphological specification uh, telling us how the word is going to behave when we place it in a larger utterance. So, for example, as I was saying the morphological specification for the word eat includes that it is a root form and its past tense is eight or its continuous tense is eating. So, we sort of figure out that okay, which form of the word eat am I going to use and then we can move on further. Now, remember here whichever form of the word that you finalize, you will really need to start assembling sounds of that type. So, if you finalized eight, then the sounds that you start assembling will be different. If you finalized eating, then the sounds that you are uh, going to assemble will be slightly different. So, Having selected a set of morphemes to produce, morphological encoding starts activating the speech sounds uh, we need to plan the auditory movements that will eventually create the speech signal. The speech sound one produces depends on the morphemes that one has activated and also they have to be organized in the right sequence. Now again, uh, when we speak, we are not speaking phonemes in a jumbled order. While we are speaking phonemes or uh, our words are uh, obviously concatenation of phonemes, but they, we do not jumble them up. They have to be executed in the same order. For example, if we decided that we want to speak the word eating, we want to talk about the act of eating, then what we will do is we have to not only activate the sounds for the word eat and the for the uh, part ing, we have to also ensure that it comes out in the right order. We cannot say ing eat, we have to always ensure that whenever we speak, it comes out in that same order, eat, ing. This is basically also very, very important. So, the right sounds need to be activated and they need to be activated in the right order. So, just summing up, what have we done so far? We started with conceptualization, we eventually selected lemmas, we went to morphological specification, then we figured out which morphemes we are going to go with and then we had information about, okay, which sounds we need to activate and in what order so that we can go further with the process of speech production. Once you have everything with you, once you have the morphemes slotted into the right positions, once you have activated their individual speech sounds, then what you are ending up with is that lexical entry uh, called a lexeme. It is basically uh, how a particular word exists in your mental lexicon which is your mental dictionary and for this we need to activate now, start activating now the basic sounds that will create this lexeme and will need to be organized in a particular manner for production. Okay? So, one of the organizational schemes that is preferred by human speakers is called syllabification. We do not speak in individual sounds, rather we speak in syllables. Let us, let us look at an example of that. Now, syllabification has two, two parts. It basically requires us activating a metrical structure. Say for example, if I am talking about the word pat, it is a single syllable or if I am talking about the word 
patter uh, it, it is two syllables so you say pat and then there's a break and then you say er so basically we need to understand the metrical structure where the stress would be say for example uh, the word banana has the stress on the second syllable b na na and the word panama has the stress on the first syllable pa na ma so basically what we are doing is we are organizing things according to their uh, according to their syllable structure and also at that same point emphasizing which parts of the syllable will be stressed which parts will not be stressed and this information is very very important because it tells us how exactly we have to uh, produce these things say for example banana uh, uh, will basically involve stress on the second syllable and we'll speak the second syllable slightly louder than we have spoken the first or the third syllables similarly in panama we are going to be slightly louder on the first syllable as opposed to the second and the third syllable now this is basically while it seems you know as i was saying in the beginning while it seems that speech production is a very easy job it basically requires us paying attention to these very very minute details uh, and uh, you know uh, managing and coordinating between these different levels of representations uh, so that speech production uh, happens seamlessly and it also happens uh, you know rather rapidly uh, typically if you see people don't make a lot of speech errors we we speak rather fluently we speak uh, not only with the content that we want to speak but we also have these intonations these uh, uh, you know different emphasis points etc so that we can also communicate uh, part of our emotions uh, part of our the emphasis non verbally as well so in that sense you can see that all of these activities are rather sophisticated and require a lot of attention Uh, again as i said uh, banana the stress is on the second syllable you can see the stress marker is on the second uh, syllable here in panama the stress is on the first syllable and you can say the stress marker is on the first syllable now uh, people would wonder that oh is syllabification an actual process do we really go through syllabification and for that you could look at how we speak you can just sample any uh, amount of speech that somebody has spoken and you could try and see whether that speech segment is organized according to actual word forms morphology or basically according to a stress scheme for example if uh, you are talking about the word escorting uh, escorting typically has two morphemes it has a free morpheme escort it has a bound morpheme uh, ing and typically what we, we should expect is that if somebody is speaking escorting they should basically do escort and ing but if you record a different number of people speaking the word you will see that when we are speaking or It, just observe yourself speaking the word escorting you will see that at s i took a pause caught i took a pause and ing so what we are basically doing is i am speaking s cor and ting which is basically the syllabic structure in which this word is constructed so speech production you can see here is not basically uh, following morphemic boundaries but rather it is following syllabic boundaries and this is a important property of our speech production system because this is how or this is how smoothly the vocal apparatus actually uh, moves around to create these words so uh, as should be clear with this example we do not simply activate morphemes we activate the phonemes that go with each morpheme and we produce them in sequence moreover after these morphemes are activated we calculate the best way to organize the sequence of these phonemes into syllables and it is the syllables that actually form the basis of how we are going to produce them along with stress information and so on uh so yeah while we do not uh, while we need morphemes and words to plan what to speak uh, speech does not simply involve activating the speech sounds in uh, individual words it involves a uh, much more detailed speech planning and it uh, basically involves activation uh, morphemes words uh, it figures out the stress uh, uh, marking and so on and it in that sense becomes Uh, a slightly sophisticated slightly coordinated uh, activity that eventually uh, ends up in production of speech now once you've done syllabification uh, what we are ending up with is called a phonological word how are we going to speak something so for, for example if you are going to speak escorting we have three parts we have escorting this is the set of phonological words and this is how we are going to uh, execute this according to the weaver plus plus model of william levelt uh, one can begin to speak as soon as you have activated all the syllables of a given phonological word further 
we can plan each utterance by activating a number of lemmas and morphemes simultaneously. It's a fast process you can see and basically the actual speech uh, movements are, uh, base, are planned one phonological word at a time. So, escort, escort and tus uh, or escort and ting and these are basically uh, you know uh, you can say mini executable programs that are, that are executed one after the other in a, uh, you know a specific sequence so that speech production uh, seems very very uh, you know seamless. So, uh, another part that could mean that we could sort of uh, you know talk a little bit about is that uh, how are uh, how do we ensure that people are actually executing this process in an ordered manner uh, and uh, this can be seen and this has been demonstrated through a bunch of experiments uh, some of them done by Wielden and Levelt where if you ask people to monitor how they are speaking and if you basically ask them to uh, you know let's say press a button if a uh, uh, you know particular target phoneme comes you will see that they will press faster if the uh, target phoneme comes from the uh, beginning of the word than if it comes in the middle or the end of the word. Okay. So, let us just summarize how this Weaver++ model or how speech production in monolinguals work or generally how speech production works. We begin with a set of ideas uh, that the speaker wishes to express which is the conceptualization phase. In the next phase we basically uh, tied the overall idea to lexical concepts basically words which are capable of expressing our ideas because then because each language will have its own specific words that it will use to convey a particular idea. Uh, but also may require combination of words say for example, we have compound words, we have phrases and so on and so forth. Now, after we have finalized on the set of lexical concepts, after these have been activated, we will activate the lemmas that correspond to these uh, specific lexical concepts. Uh, activating lemmas would provide us uh, about information about the morphological properties of the words including information about how words can be combined. After a set of morphemes has been activated and organized into a sequence, the speech sounds uh, that are required can be activated and again placed in the syllable sequence as we discussed. Phonological encoding involves the activation of metrical structures and syllabification so that we know how each syllable is to be produced in what order and with what uh, emphasis. The outcome of this is a phonological uh, word consisting of syllable size frames. Finally, we come closer to articulation. So, what we are doing here is during phonetic encoding, the speech production system basically consults a set of stored representations for specific syllables. So, it is basically again as I said mini executable program. So, how do I say S, how do I say PAT, how do I say B and basically these programs are concatenated, they are sort of uh, brought together and what the system does is it activates these appropriate syllable representations and places them in the correct order so that they can be executed very quickly one after the other as the demands of the speech production system are. This, this final representation is called a gestural score which basically creates executable commands of how these syllables are, need, are going to be articulated. So, that is pretty much a generic understanding or a generic description of how speech production really happens. You can uh, uh, see that in this model we started at the top with conceptual preparation, we had like we have uh, tied those ideas to lexical concepts, we did some selection, selected lemmas, uh, did some morphological encoding of which form of the word we are going to use, uh, then we have uh, fixed out which morphemes we are going to finally select, when went to phonological encoding, deciding syllables, creating a phonological word and then we did phon phonetic encoding phonetic gestural score which is an executing command and then articulation happens which basically ends up in a sound wave which is a physical stimulus that is received by the ears of the listener so that comprehension can take place. So, that is all that I wanted to talk about a generic and give you a generic understanding of speech production in monolinguals and in, uh, in monolinguals and in the next lectures we will look at some of the processing assumptions of this model and how these processing assumptions may need to be sort of uh, tweaked a little bit in order to account for bilingual or multilingual speech production as well. Thank you.